The next demo is going to get inside your mind, or blow your mind, or at least my partner's mind. It is a really interesting look inside Jeff Fowler's brain. So I'd like to welcome up UCSF neuroscientist Adam Ghazali, who's pushing the boundaries of what you can do with your brain. And I'd also like to welcome up my partner in crime, Uncle Fester. We got people? Hello, hello. All right, so Jeff, you're going to sit here. Okay. And I'm going to ask you. Yes. What have you done to my friend? Well, let's show you. Let's pull up some images, and I'll tell you a story about uh, what we have here. So um, let's pull up the brain. Earlier this uh, this week, last week, Jeff came into our lab. I'm a UCSF professor, and we put him in an MRI scanner, a 3T scanner. And what you're looking at here is a 3D reconstruction of Jeff's brain. It looks like it might have come out of a jar of formaldehyde. I could assure you that it didn't. It's still comfortably inside his head. And what you're really looking at is an MRI image, both the surface structure as well as the deep fibers underneath, which are colored in this golden fiber. We can actually bring up more of them. We could bring on other brain structures. And so here is a 3D reconstruction of Jeff's brain. But what We've now done, which is more exciting, and this is new technology that we're developing in my lab with several collaborations, is that Jeff's wearing a 64-channel wireless EEG cap that was uh, custom-made by a group called Cognionics for this uh, new technology that we're developing. And what we uh, can now do is use that MRI information with its high spatial resolution to guide our understanding of the electrical signals in the brain using EEG. So this was a collaboration with colleagues at UCSD uh, at the Swartz Center where they've developed a lot of these algorithms. And then we work with NVIDIA to use GPU technology to get large computational jobs done as quickly as possible. So what I'll show you is we could pull up a couple of different pieces of data here. So what you're looking at here is several different things. Each of these different colors represent a different frequency. So this is basically live, real-time information. We got this down to around two-tenths of a second. We use the MRI to guide where the sources are localized with the EEG to get, create a better predictive model of that. Each of these colors represent a different frequency of activity in Jeff's brain. Within these 200 milliseconds, we do the source localization, we do artifact correction, and we do this other process called multivariate Granger causality, which you can see is these streams of information flying between brain areas. And what we do is we look at synchrony between rhythms in different brain areas, and then the latency offset to create these computational models of how different brain areas are communicating with each other. So we take all of this information and we actually bring it into the Unity game engine where we do a lot of game development in my lab. You can see right here I'm just using an Xbox joystick. And then we can uh, really manipulate this beautiful 3D structure. Jeff, and we're just going inside your brain right now. Fly do on it. Do you feel it? Do you feel us in there? <laughs> so there you go. So this is now um, within the brain structure. It's and really just an Xbox controller? Yep, yep, just a regular controller using um, uh, the Unity game engine, just bringing all this 3D data, all the real-time temporal information that we're getting from the EG, and then we could just essentially look around. We have several different versions of this. This one is on a nice big screen. We also have one that we do with, uh, with the Oculus Rift, so you could fly through your own brain and virtual reality. It's quite a surreal experience. I encourage you to try that out. Can I fly through yeah, Jeff's we brain? Yeah, we could pass it on to you. Jeff, I'm going inside your brain now. <laughs> well, well, what are you finding in there? Well, it's funny, not much. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of things happening. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't see anything in here, actually. And so what is, what's going to be the use of all this info? What, what good is it going to be for someone like me or Jeff? Okay, well, you fly, I'll, I'll, I'll fill everyone in. So what you're looking at is really brand new. It's largely proof of concept. And we have several different goals in my lab now to see how we can use this to push on, in several different directions. The first is diagnostics. So what does it mean? So Jeff is playing a game now that was developed in our lab. And we, one of the main things we do is build custom-designed video games to challenge people's information 
information processing abilities in different ways, use adaptivity of the game engine so that we're constantly challenging them right at their ability level, and then use feedback algorithms to make it fun and engaging and immersive. And we've shown that we can use these games to improve how people's brains operate, largely older adults, individuals over 60 years old. And so one of the things that we're interested in is what does it mean to have someone engaging in a game that's challenging their brain in a very specific way, and then look in real time what is occurring in that brain. What does this mean to therapy real-time diagnostics? So the next time you see, this is probably the last time we'll do this demo, the next thing that you'll see is we will have another one screen showing what's going on in the game, another screen showing what's going on in the brain, and we will show correlated events. While he makes a response to a certain stimulus in the game, we will see that event occurring in his brain. We've already started working on those. And what does it mean for a therapist to put on an Oculus Rift and fly through a patient's brain and look at how it's performing in real time is a question that we're pursuing. So he, would be, he could be playing a game right now where he's yes. actually... <laughs> Hit, like let's say obstacles that are inside his brain, things that yeah. pop up. So that's that's the next thing. The next so, step. So, so the first step is: can we use this as a novel diagnostic? Where we want to go is actually use this as a therapeutic tool to create a full closed loop feedback system. So our games already work based on closed loops. Your behavior, your performance gets read out by the game in real time, and we use that information to guide the game mechanics of adaptivity and feedback. What we hope to do is to be able to take these brain signals, feed them into the software. So again, essentially the game will be diagnosing the weaknesses of how your brain processes information and then use that data to guide the gameplay so that we could sort of focus the different active ingredients of the game on weak processes, like a gamma knife uh, getting right in there to fine tune processes. And we see this as having both benefits in the world of education, maybe a new type of education, ways of fine tuning cognition at a very fundamental level in people that are healthy, as well as a tool uh, for those that are impaired as part of the mental health field, so for both psychiatric and neurological patients. The biggest win, the most extreme idea that we have that we're now working on, is not even having the game be different than the brain. But one of the projects we have going is that Jeff would uh, fly inside his own brain and play a game that uses the stimuli, the signals in his brain as the stimuli in the game. That's so like crazy. a very sort of futuristic version of neurofeedback, where time locked to events occurring in his brain, he's learning how to control them using these closed uh, feedback loops. Maybe this could also, you could work with uh, James Cameron, maybe work this into right. the next Avatar? Yeah, I mean, hey, you know, I, I think that there's a, a lot of potential. We actually do much more with this in the entertainment industry right now than we do in the science world um, because we really just built out the, the technology and now we're pushing ahead actively with our research. One other thing that we can do, and we've already started this project, is that we could use these signals to guide the stimulation parameters of electrical stimulation at the surface, both DC and AC current. So as I described to you, these are different rhythms of his brain. We might find that he has a, a deficiency of engaging midline frontal theta, low frequency activity that we see in many of our older participants. Not, not that you're old it, there. Yeah, his looks good, right? <laughs> his looks good. Okay. And uh, we could use that data to guide a stimulator where we could stimulate the brain at four hertz frequency right at those key parts of the game to try to drive his engagement of that region and the networks that it's associated with. So what we see in the future are multiple closed loops guided off of both his performance and his neural data guiding the gameplay as well as brain stimulation. And this might be something that you would use for someone that had a stroke or a lesion where they needed extra plasticity within a cortical region uh, for their recovery. Could a surgeon use this? It's interesting that you say that. So um, again, so we have uh, this new lab uh, at UCSF that, that we just finished constructing called the Neuroscape Lab, which basically brings in cutting edge technology like this that's often in game companies uh, or multimedia labs, but right into a neuroscience, neurology, psychiatry clinic and um, integrate how even consumer facing technology can sort of be validated right alongside a lot of the companies that we have partnerships with to see if we can develop these out as scientific and medical tools. So while we have this, we do a lot of tours and, and any of you are welcome to come by and take a look at it. And 
uh, people at UCSF as well as those from the outside visit. And we just had a neurosurgeon visit and his jaw fell open. He does surgeries every single day. He's like, why would I operate on someone's tumor if the, neck, if the day before I didn't fly through their brain and understand it from a better three-dimensional perspective. You have to remember, they're largely looking at 2D images when they do this. Now maybe this could even be used in the OR in some other version of it, but even right now, if we image someone's brain with a lesion and had a surgeon put on a, a, a VR uh, goggles and then fly through, they'd get a different perspective of it. So I think it does have applications in that world as well. And right now, to create this cap, it's, it's specially tailored to, to Jeff and different patients, right? Yeah, so this is Jeff's brain, and right now it's only working on someone's brain that's tailored to them. So it's a pretty big process. Right. Um, Jeff, you know, we've been doing this all week of, of the brain scanning, all the processing. We've actually worked with NVIDIA and their GPUs to even speed up. So even this, just the MRI part of this usually takes days to process. We've gotten that down to almost a half a day. So we look at this as a single day process now. Um, so, so this is on his MRI image, which we think um, will benefit the eventual outcomes that I described to you by giving the spatial information that we need to interpret the functional data. But it's possible that everyone won't need their own MRI to do this, that you might be able to use normalized brain data. We just don't know that right now. But we're working with large companies and talking with GE and looking at how to make this technology more accessible so that it is scalable. Because our ultimate goals are to have scalable um, type of technologies. For example, this cap here, while it's not a consumer product now, we work with other companies that are getting pretty close to it, um, to having caps that will be available to people that can record rich, robust, reproducible data. I mean, we're just getting very close to that now, but there's still some pretty major hurdles to accomplish. Great. Well, I think, Je Jeff, you want to go take your cap off or you want to keep it I on? I want to keep it on. <laughs> you want to keep it on? Well, are you, are you feeling good about your brain? Are you feeling? Well, Adam says it's looking okay, so there. I trust him. All right. Well, thank you guys. It's pretty both. good, Brad. Thank you, Jeff, <laughs> for sharing your brain. Thank you for going inside his brain. Thank you, everyone.